I think that science's biggest challenge to Christianity was Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. In 1859, Darwin published On the Origin of Species, which suggested that life on Earth was not designed by God, but had evolved through a process called natural selection. My colleague Richard Dawkins has become the best-known critic of religion, some would say the Archbishop of Atheism. For him, evolution is the best reason for not believing in God. Richard, I guess you could say that after Copernicus and Galileo, evolutionary theory was the second great challenge to conventional religious belief. How did Darwin himself deal with it? He was well aware that it was a great challenge, and he was appropriately cautious before releasing it. He delayed for something like 20 years after writing it out, and I mean, some people think the main reason for his delay was caution because of the effect it would have on the religious establishment. Christians had always believed that human beings were made in God's image, but Darwin's theory implied that we are, in fact, apes. Darwin removed the main argument for God's existence because uh, before, before Darwin, it looked as though the evident, apparent design of living things um, could only be interpreted as, as, as actual design. Some people seem to have come to terms with evolution, as they did with Copernicanism, by saying it's just a, an, an illumination of the wonders of God. I find it remarkably unconvincing because the suggestion is that, that God, in deciding to create life, chose to do it in precisely the way that made it look as though he wasn't there. Well, well you could say that the difficult bit was creating the physics of the universe with all its improbabilities in such a way that it, it, it would allow evolution to occur. That's a much better way to look at it. I mean, that's a, that, there's a certain amount of plausibility about that. I find it ultimately implausible because it suggests that an intelligent creator would need a, an even bigger explanation himself. This wonderful university museum at Oxford exudes Victorian confidence in the special power of human beings. It was here in 1860 that Samuel Wilberforce, the Bishop of Oxford, defended Christianity against the onslaught of Thomas Henry Huxley, the great champion of Darwin. There's no doubt that Darwin's discovery of a natural mechanism that could explain the origin of all life on Earth, including human beings, without divine intervention, was a serious challenge to conventional religious belief. Christians are still uncertain and divided about how to respond to evolution. The overwhelming evidence for Darwin's theory has led the mainstream churches to concede that humans were not literally made by God. But they cling to the idea that God made evolution possible. This kind of accommodation has become a familiar pattern. It's not a matter of overturning what we thought before. It's more a matter of saying that what we were taught when we were seven years old is still true, but there's so much more going on that we, we couldn't possibly have handled when we were seven years old. Well, I mean, you seem to be talking about a kind of plasticine God, a God that begins stretched and deformed to fit any shape you want to, oh. informed <laughs> by science, but stretched no. still to fit with the changing image of the reality of the world that science is giving us. It's no more plasticine than the universe is plasticine as our understanding of it shifts. The plasticine is up here. Yes. As I'm older, my mind can stretch a little bit closer to the dimensions of the God that was out there all the time. Mainstream Christianity has been so influenced by the Enlightenment that its views are now totally different from those of 400 years ago. But the beliefs of some Christians in the United States have hardly changed at all. A recent poll found that almost one third of Americans still believe that the biblical story of creation is literally true. It's extraordinary to think that the word fundamentalism, which we nowadays associate with extreme governments, Islamic regimes, actually originated here in the United States. I want to find out how it could be that in this secular country, built on the success of science and technology, 
those kinds of fundamental views of Christianity could still survive. This is Dayton, Tennessee, in the heart of the Bible Belt. In 1925, a state law was passed that made the teaching of human evolution illegal. A local teacher, John Scopes, was tried for breaking this new law. The Chicago defense lawyer Clarence Darrow was pitted against William Jennings Bryan, a former presidential candidate. The trial took place in this courtroom. Now you have given considerable study to the Bible, haven't you, Mr. Bryan? Yes, sir, I have tried to. You claim that everything in the Bible should be literally interpreted. I believe everything in the Bible should be accepted as it is given there. Now, some is illustrative. For example, ye are the salt of the earth. Now, I would not insist that man was actually salt or had flesh of salt, but it is used in the sense of salt as saving God's people. Now, Scopes was found guilty. His trial marked the start of a battle over the teaching of evolution that still continues in some American states. I am simply trying to protect the word of God, the greatest atheist or agnostic in the United States. Professor Ron Numbers, who grew up near Dayton, was born into a fundamentalist Christian family. My father was a fundamentalist preacher here. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventists were the people who gave the world young earth creationism. Young earth means what exactly? Well, that you don't believe there was anything here more than about 6,000 years. You ask about the relationship. Early fundamentalists were appalled by the diluted form of Christianity that had emerged from the Enlightenment. It was the influence of Germany, German scholarship and some English scholarship especially that scared the bejesus out of evangelicals in America. They would send over young scholars and they would come back tainted with this. They didn't believe in the virgin birth or the resurrection anymore. They didn't believe Moses had written the first five books of the Bible. It was knowledge of science that convinced Ron to abandon his beliefs. He now lectures on every aspect of fundamentalism, including the fundamentalist version of science. Almost to a person, these fundamentalists profess to love science. They love science. Back in the 1920s, at the time of the Scopes trial here, the anti-evolutionists argued against evolution on the grounds that it didn't deserve the good name of science. It was too speculative. There wasn't enough evidence, and science was something wonderful. 